you will notice um, the seats are arranged differently this evening. We are round tables. Uh, when in rows, the emphasis is inevitably on what happens up here, up the front, and that's all well and good. Uh, when we want to make the emphasis about somewhere else, rows can be a little bit uh, difficult and make things harder. And tonight, we really want to create space and opportunity for us to together uh, listen to what we believe God is saying specifically to us, specifically now, and make sure that we can capture that. And so we've laid out the room a little bit differently. Uh, you're seated differently. And in a moment, Josh is going to walk through these doors with something so that I can be seated a little bit differently. Because in this kind of environment, um, I thought rather than me standing, and I'm kind of waffling now to see if I can make this sentence that I've started now last all the way until the time, which reminds me of another thing. Nope, can't do it. Um, I'm just going to wait for Josh to come through with the, uh, with the stool in a moment. Here we go. Round of applause for Josh. There we go. Thanks very much. Um, so I want us to have something that is much more akin this evening to a, a conversation. Um, I'm going to share a few things, but then I want us to have a chance to um, talk and to share a few things as well. This whole term, we've been exploring uh, some, some, some letters that are recorded at the very beginning of the last book of the Bible. The book of uh, Revelation, the first three chapters, we read some letters that are uh, sort of transcribed by a friend of Jesus called John, but they're written by Jesus to seven specific churches in, uh, across, across a sort of province, across a region. Um, and, and they're being shared messages that are directly for them for what it is that the church in their town is like and what it is that Jesus loves about that and what he wants to challenge about that. And we've been doing that, but that's not an end in itself. It's very interesting. It's very uh, fascinating to hear about what different churches are like. And sometimes we can hear ourselves in them and sometimes it doesn't seem very much like us. But the purpose of this whole term and what we've been doing is to listen to the kinds of things that Jesus might say to his churches so that we can understand the kinds of things that Jesus might want to say to us. I don't think it's an exhaustive list of things that God might want to say to his church, but it is a list of things that he might, a list of things that we know he might because he has to other people in different places. And I want to do two things this evening. I want to very quickly run through and recap what it is that Jesus said to each of those churches. If you want to go deeper and dive into more detail, then head to our website where you can listen to the recordings from each week. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that in massive detail today. But it might be that you, uh, this is your first time to our church. It might be that this is all new to you. I want to be able to uh, help you. It might be that you've been here every single week, but a bit of a refresher, a bit of a reminder would be helpful. You'll notice on your, uh, on your tables, there are some sheets that have seven boxes with seven little pictures and sort of summary verses. I want to explore and explain what it is roughly that Jesus said to each of those churches. And then I want to ask us what it means for us to listen to Jesus tonight, what it means for us to say, okay, brilliant. This is what he said in the past. What is it that he's saying to us now? And once we've figured that out, what is it that we have a responsibility to do with it? So those are the two things that I want to do. You might want to grab a, grab a pen, uh, jot down some notes, uh, maybe be listening uh, specifically, asking in your mind the question, is this like us at Gold Hill? It might be that you're visiting from another church. You might think, is this like the church that I've come from? Is there something that Jesus might be wanting to say through me to them? Uh, when I head back home. So here are the seven churches in uh, Revelation chapters two and three. The first is the letter to the church in Ephesus. And this was a church that had in the past been going great guns and they still believed the right things. They still had good doctrine. They still practiced a lot of the right things, but their passion had gone. This is a church who we read that you have forsaken the love that you had first, their first love, their passion for Jesus has ebbed. It's subsided. They're still faithful. They're still pursuing him. They're still doing the right things, but actually their passion and their love and their depth of joy in Jesus has faded away. That's the first church, the church in Ephesus. The second church, the church in Smyrna, this is a church that has faced an awful lot of hardship, an awful lot of trials. This is a church that's had a hard time of it, and they've been faithful. They've kept on going. But the message is actually a difficult one because it says things are going to get worse. But don't be afraid. You're going to suffer greater things. Things aren't going to be easy for you. You face trials. The next period of your life is going to contain trials as well. Jesus is very kind. And sometimes he warns his people 
when hardship is going to come. But he warns them at the beginning, it's going to come, but don't be afraid. Because nothing can take you from me. I'm still with you. That's the church in Smyrna. Then there's the church in Pergamum. This is a church who um, remained true to Jesus, who uh, still proclaim him. But actually, they've started also listening to some teaching which is wrong. They've started listening to some people who are saying wrong things about Jesus. And they've started to believe it. The gospel that they've believed, the good news that they've believed, has started to be watered down. They've started to uh, have things come into their church, doctrines and ideas and teaching to do with uh, sexuality and different parts of, uh, of, of life and different, uh, different parts of worship and to do with food offered to idols and different things that were sort of making them less pure. Things that they were embracing that God wouldn't want them to. And so Jesus calls them to repent. He, he calls them to turn away from those things that they believe which are wrong and come back to him. Jesus is very kind and he calls us back when we've wandered astray. Then to the church in uh, Thyatira. <clears throat> and I remember when Maria was preaching on this, um, she was honest, and I'll be honest in saying she wasn't sure if that's how you pronounce it, but it's what she went with. You went with Thyatira, didn't you? I'll go with Thyatira as well. I wouldn't want to contradict you. Um, this is, uh, in some ways, a little bit similar to the church in, uh, in Pergamum. But this time, it's not so much that they've embraced just wrong doctrines and wrong teaching. It's that actually they've embraced some people who are doing all kinds of things that are wrong. This, 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 uh, this person who's referred to as Jezebel. This person who's done all kinds of things that are not good and not right. And the church is saying, no, it's fine, keep on going. Instead of lovingly challenging her and saying, this is not okay, as part of our community, we're, we're, we're calling you back to a place of deeper holiness. One is about entertaining wrong ideas. The other is about almost entertaining wrong people. And of course, all of us are wrong people. All of us do things that are wrong. All of us get, get things wrong and there are mistakes that we make. But, but this time, this isn't so much about saying, yes, I know I've done something wrong, but I'm experiencing the grace of Jesus. This is about someone saying, I don't care. I don't think what I'm doing is wrong and I'm going to keep on doing it. And a church saying, fine. And Jesus calls them instead to, uh, to not behave like that and instead to call that out. Then we come to the church in Sardis, the, the fifth of the churches. This is a church that had a great reputation. The other people around saw this church and thought, hey, you're fantastic. You're doing brilliant things. We've heard amazing things that have come from you. But actually, the reality didn't live up to the reputation. Inside, they weren't quite as good as they looked on the outside. And I had deep regret after I preached this passage, so I'm glad I can have a do-over. Because after I uh, shared on, this, uh, on, on that evening, I realized that I'd missed a trick. Because what I should have said is that the TARDIS looked bigger on the, on, looks bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. But in Sardis, their faith looked bigger on the outside than it really was on the inside. I know. Anyway, um, so they had a reputation but it was actually bigger than their reality. Maybe who they used to be, but it had faded away. And Jesus was calling them back to come back. Jesus is kind. And when actually he can see that the reality isn't quite what we'd like it to be. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't tell us off. Instead, he says, come and clothe yourself again with me. Come and let your reality grow in me. Then there's the church in Philadelphia. <clears throat> this is another church that has suffered a lot. This is a church that has had to endure patiently. This is a church who have had all kinds of people telling them that, that God doesn't want anything to do with them, telling them that the door is shut, telling them that, that, that God has closed the door on them. They've had lots of people telling them all kinds of things about themselves that aren't true. And so Jesus is kind to them. And Jesus loves them. And he says, look, the doors that I open, no one can ever close. And the doors that I close, no one can ever open. It doesn't matter what other people tell you about who you are. Believe what I tell you about who you are. You've endured patiently, continue enduring. And then finally, the church in Laodicea. And uh, this is a church that there's this quite famous um, statement that Jesus says to them. He says, you're neither, hot nor, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. They've gone lukewarm. They're not, they're not sort of um, extreme and radical in either direction. Their faith is kind of a bit meh. And actually, he goes on to say that it's because they're, fa they're far too comfortable. It's because they've, they've, sort of, they've got wealth and they've got comfort and they've got security in lots of human ways. They're secure. But as a result, they've just become a bit stagnant. They've become a bit meh. And Jesus doesn't want them to be that. And so he calls them to sort of reignite that passion and to reignite their faith. Not to be quite so 
comfortable, not to be quite so materialistic, not to be quite so consumeristic, not to be quite so individualistic and think, well, things are going fine. I don't really need Jesus. But instead, to have a faith that is on fire, a faith that actually looks like something. So those are the churches in Revelation. Those are the things that Jesus says to each of these churches, just as a quick recap. But at the end of each of these uh, letters, there is, there's a couple of phrases that come at the end of every single one. There are two phrases. One of them is this, whoever has ears, let them hear what the, church, what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, these letters are going to be read out by the people in these churches. It'll come to them by a messenger and the people will gather around and listen. And as the, as the letter to their church is read, all of these things that are deeply personal to their situation would be heard. They're hearing the heart of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus, calling them back or spurring them on, encouraging them, rebuking them, challenging them, whatever it is for their community. And then they would all hear, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, You've heard these words, you've heard them read out, but are you willing to actually hear? Are you willing to actually listen? Are you willing to let this take root? These words, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches would have been familiar to them because Jesus himself in his earthly life, he's writing this, he's dictating this letter via an angel and to John seated at the right hand of his father in heaven. But in his earthly life, every, every so often when he used a parable to teach, Jesus would say the same thing. In Mark chapter 4, after sharing the parable of the sower, at the end of that, Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And it's a parable that's all about what happens when people hear the good news. You may remember the parable. A farmer or a sower goes out and sows the seed. And he sows lots of seed. He sows the same seed in the same way. The only difference is what happens when it falls on the soil. Whether the soil is willing to receive that word and let it take root. And there's some good soil where there's a great crop, a great fruit that comes from it. Come back to that in a moment. There's some soil which is rocky. And, and to begin with, um, it, starts to, it starts to shoot up, but it doesn't have the roots to sustain it. And so it dies away. There's other which falls on the path and there's nothing to take root in at all. And it doesn't grow in any way. And there's other seed where it starts to grow up, but it's choked by thorns. And really the difference between all of them is not what the word is, not what the message is, not what the sower does, not how effective the sower was, but instead how receptive the ground is to that soil. Whether the conditions are right for that, for that seed to be taken in and ultimately produce fruit. The one that falls on the good soil, we read that it produces a crop 30, 60, 100 times because it can grow and produce more seed, more crop, and it can keep on growing and growing and growing exponentially. The difference is not what the message is and how well it's proclaimed. The difference is whether people are ready to receive it and whether they'll bear fruit as a result. Because it's all very well to hear something and to understand it. The question is what gets done with it. The first phrase at the end of each of these letters is, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The other phrase that you find every single time is to the one who is victorious and does my will or to the one who is victorious. In other words, to the one who presses on, to the one who takes hold of everything I've said and goes forward with it, to the one who isn't beaten by all the things that have been described, but instead is victorious in me. The one who is obedient, the one who takes it. And does it. The one who is victorious and he describes a great fruit and a great blessing that awaits. And it's a different, different blessing in each of the seven letters. But the promise is there. So the question really, as we seek to listen to what Jesus says to us, is do we have ears to listen? And will we be victorious in running into it, running towards it? I don't know how you manage your email inbox. Every so often, uh, I, I put little tags on my emails, and I've got different tags meaning different things. Um, the easiest emails to deal with are the ones that you don't have to do anything with, and you can just delete straight away. They're my favorite. They're the ones that make you feel like you've got an empty inbox quickest with the least work. Things that are junk, things that you don't need to listen to, things that are rubbish and you can write off. That's one type of email. One of the other tags I've got is, I need to reply. 
I'll, I'll go through all my emails and I'll be like, yep, I'll tag that one with a little red flag, which means I need to reply and I need to reply uh, as, as soon as I can and then that will be dealt with. It will be, it, be sorted. I've read it. I've understood it. I need to say something in return. The third kind, and these are the ones that, if I'm honest, can end up lurking in my inbox for the longest because they're the ones that are hardest to deal with, which have a little blue flag in my email inbox. They're the ones that I don't just need to reply. I need to do something about it first. I've got an action that's come out of that email. I can't just reply and give an answer straight away. I've got to actually do some work and then I can reply and say, yes, I've done that work. And I might send a holding reply or I might not, but there's something that needs to be done with it. When we receive a message from Jesus, do we just put it in the bin? Disregard it straight away? I, I don't think we do. Do we listen and understand enough to say something immediately, but actually forget to put anything on our to-do list? Or are we going to listen in order to put a little blue flag in order to say, I'm going to do something about this. This is something that I'm going to be obedient to. To the one who is victorious, who presses into this. Who isn't defeated by the current situation, but instead pursues what Jesus' new situation wants to be. And so this evening, having had a little whistle-stop tour through what all of those letters are about, the kinds of things that Jesus said to those churches, we're going to take some time. We're going to take some time to listen to what Jesus is saying. And Jesus speaks in all kinds of different ways. He speaks through his word and we've, we've looked at various things that he might say. And it might be that as we've been uh, looking through this, there's, there's, there's one or two or three or however many of those churches where you go, this sounds like us. We need to listen to this. I believe God's speaking to us directly through his word. And this, this description of that church describes us. We're like the church in. Make sure that's captured. God speaks by his spirit through visions and through dreams and through uh, prophetic words. We're going to take some time before I get you talking to be listening. I'm going to put some light music on in the background and have a few minutes where we can just, each of us individually, say to Jesus, is there anything you want to say to me or say through me to other people? It's going to be space and um, there's some space at the bottom of those sheets of paper for you to jot down anything that you think um, God is saying to Gold Hill. God also speaks to other people. It might be that as we do have a little conversation uh, later on and as you speak uh, around your uh, tables, that there's, there's sort of themes, there's some things that come together. And as we sort of um, bat our thoughts and what we believe God's saying around, God will speak. I want to encourage you. God can speak to you. You can hear that. Maybe you think God couldn't possibly use you, use your voice. In the Bible, he speaks through so many different people. So many different times. Some of them felt equipped. Most of them didn't. Some of them were the kinds of people who you'd expect to hear from God through. Most of them weren't. He even speaks through a donkey at one point. So I think that gives me hope that he might be able to speak through me. So we're going to take some time. And before our service started, those of us who were sort of on team, we took some time to wander around this room and pray. And pray over different seats and pray that the person who was sat there would be able to hear something from Jesus. The seat that you are in most likely had someone before the service put their hand on it and say, God, would you speak to the person who sits in this seat this evening? Would you enable them to hear something from you and be able to share it? So we're going to take just a couple of minutes. I'm going to pray and then we're going to take a few minutes of just quiet. No need to talk yet. We're going to listen to what Jesus might say. Jot something down. Don't. Whatever works best for you. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are kind. Thank you that you speak to us never to make us feel bad, always to lead us on. Thank you that you speak words of comfort and encouragement to us when we need to hear them. Thank you that when you have so much more for us than we're currently experiencing or allowing, you speak words of gentle challenge and kindness to draw us back. Lord Jesus, we declare that this is an open space this evening. By your spirit, would you move? Would you prompt? Would you give us nudges and words and phrases and ideas and pictures? As we reflect on these words of scripture, would you do the same? Lord God, speak. Your people are listening. What do you want to say to us?